a quartz clock pendulum mechanism with a piece of cable dangling from it. Quite a long bit of cable. How long can I go before I start showing the terrible pile of mess below it? Uh, so this mechanism is interesting because it's self-starting, but if you don't secure the cable or the extension of the pendulum onto it, it uh, will sort of hit a sort of resonant frequency at that point. It is trying to self-start at the moment. If you give it long enough, it will self-start. I'll give it a wee push and you'll see this is what happens if you don't secure the pendulum onto it properly. But um, that's enough of that. Let's take it to bits. So here is the pendulum unit. It's designed to take a standard quartz movement in this sort of cutout in here. And it just acts as a pendulum. And as it's supplied, it comes out a battery, which is a good idea because it draws passive current. I've checked that uh, when it's not in use. It comes with a little plastic stud here. And if you're actually not using it, well, I would recommend taking the battery out. But if you're not using it, you can click it onto that stud. It stops this flapping about, but it also stops it triggering the mechanism and possibly drawing a bit more current. So this came from eBay, rather predictably. eBay, the whole great stuff. Uh, it came from a seller called Bee House, B-E-H-O-U-S-E. -E. It cost a measly £1.29. And it says, Quartz Pendulum Drive Unit Module for All Standard Movements Dash Clock Making Bullshit. Excellent. And, yeah, I ordered a couple. Because I thought, let's uh, analyse them. Let's see if the circuit boards in them are interesting or the circuitry is something special. So, if I unlock this and I just hold it vertically, it will rapidly uh, accelerate up to the like those annoying solar ornaments you get, that it starts tapping loudly on each side. Uh-huh. And you can either hang a pendulum from the bottom of this, or with they've got the option for actually pressing things on top for those clocks that are the sort of things that have the reverse pendulum, where it's something moving on top. Because sometimes these are used just as ornaments. You see the... You see the sort of classic cat's eye image where it's a, the cat's eyes are moving and the tail's wagging behind a sort of panel. And that's kind of the same mechanism. It's cheap and cheerful. I think we should open it. Let's take the batch out and get this apart. I'm going to try and get the pendulum off first. These things tend to go the same way. They're made in the same factories as the clock mechanisms, so they tend to be just clipped together. Things worthy of note, to provide a low resistance bearing, this seems to be just tubular. And it's uh, got a tiny little dot there to keep it from rubbing against the surface at the back, I'm guessing. And then in here, it's just got a tiny little wedge that it rides on. Can you see that tiny little wedge there? that it just rocks on the top of that. It just means it's a very, very low friction bearing because it's just rocking on a sort of an edge, so to speak. This has two magnets. Magnet. And they both just point the same way. So that one is repelling and that one's attracting. So these magnets are opposite polarity. That's odd. I was expecting this just to be a standard mechanism. It must be an, an advantage to having two magnets in the opposite polarity. This bit down here, this is where I'm going to break it probably. These wings seem to fold out from the side. Oh, that comes apart very easily. And we have the classic arrangement of the circuit board with the battery contacts. What's that little wire? There's a little copper wire sticking out there. But we have the classic arrangement of the... Uh, the contacts that look as though they're soldered straight down onto it, so the whole lot slides in with the battery contacts and slides out. That's very easy to get out. That's refreshing. Oh, it's got three capacitors. What's that little wire? Oh, they've done that thing where there's the coil with ultra-fine wire and they've just pulled the wires out and they've just blobbed them onto solder pads. Uh, I'll get down close to this, but I'm just about to, you know, should I do this? Because I'm just about to reverse engineer it, haven't I? It is a single-sided board. It's not even got a screen print on it. It's just everything is kind of uh, visible through the circuit board material, which is quite nice. Right, tell you what, I'm going to reverse engineer this and we'll explore the circuitry. One slightly longer than expected reverse engineering, not because it actually took long to reverse engineer it, but because it was such an, an interesting circuit that I cracked out the dark and stormy. 
and actually managed in the process of my reverse engineering to design a complete new circuit board for it, which I shall experiment with later. I've not made one of these yet. It was just to see how easy it was to put the track layout. I mean, it, it just seems such an easy track layout. This, this is better up this way because uh, that would be the positive and this would be the negative. This would be the negative down here. Anyway, I digress. That is for later. The design is fascinating because when you reverse engineer and I'm just going to leave this here a moment so that if you want you can take a little snapshot of this design here not design this the circuit board and it will let you have a wee go at reverse engineer it yourself if you want as you'll zoom as you back zoom back out that's just fine we have the coil here things worthy of note the coil has two windings it's got a red winding and a yellow winding. They both appear to have the same resistance, the same number of turns, because it looks like they've been wound on together. And they seem to just be two coils that have been wound on, but then the polarity has been reversed. And the way they've done that, they've taken the red wire from this side and tacked it on here, and the yellow wire from this side, and then the remaining wire has been tacked. That's why they've got them coloured red and yellow, so they can differentiate between the two windings when they're... Uh, hand soldering these, I presume. They've done what they usually do. They've pulled the wires uh, over the edge of the circuit board and then they've uh, flowed them into the solder. It's just easiest to do that way. And they haven't even cropped them off. They've just left them loose, which is always a bit messy, but you know what? It's what they do. The circuit when reverse engineered is kind of interesting. Does it look familiar? It might look familiar because it's very similar to what's called an A-stable multivibrator. Let me bring in an A-stable multivibrator, courtesy, let's tame that down just a little bit, of Wikipedia. So this is a classic multivibrator design. In the, this case, instead of using these resistors, they've used the coils. And the coils actually are have a quite high resistance. It's the, the Measured one measured very slight difference from the other just because the gauge of the copper will just its tolerance really But roughly about they averaged out 365 ohms each very close The difference to this design is that these resistors here Are actually tacked across here Which is odd and they've also got an extra capacitor coupled from here down to the base of this transistor. Now, uh, it's worth mentioning that the original multivibrator circuit was discovered in 1919 by Henry Abraham and Eugene Bloch, who were both French beardy geek physicists, who came up with the circuit and it's designed for... They originally designed it around valves or tubes, thermionic tubes. And the reason they called it a multivibrator is because the output is very rich in harmonics. So they uh, basically, well, their design was, uh, so that's why they called it a multivibrator, because it was vibrating at multiple frequencies, multiple harmonics. And it's got some really interesting attributes. Now, it's called the A-stable multivibrator because it's not stable in either state. It always toggles backwards and forwards. You get a monostable multivibrator, which is... Uh, Stable in one state, but when triggered, goes to the other state, but can't stay there and goes back. And you get the bi-stable multivibrator, which is stable in both states, but you actually switch between the two of them. Very similar to this, but with buttons, so you can toggle between the two sides. But this is the A-stable multivibrator. Okay, let's take a look at their implementation in this design. Two high-value resistors, 220K. Those are those little dinky red ones. Oh, I should bring this in. I should bring in the exhibit here. Let me shield this from the light so you can see the lights blinking backwards and forwards. I've added a couple of LEDs into that to show it, it is stabling. And uh, it's much faster than uh, the LEDs have interfered with operation. It's much uh, faster than it would normally be. In its passive state, if you remove the LEDs and you hold a very small magnet up to it and just rock it on the point to just borderline, because it's very low output uh, of magnetic field, the borderline of just uh, tilting on that, it's roughly th every three seconds it goes tap. Tap. So it's very slow. But here's the thing about the multivibrators. They're prone to being able to lock into frequencies. In the old electric organs they were apparently used, this is another Wiki, Wiki, Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia entry uh, about them that says that they were used in the old organs one per octave, uh, as a, you'd have a master oscillator per octave, and then you for every subdivided frequency you'd have one of these 
uh, to set to roughly that frequency, but then they are very easily influenced. And this is what's happening here. This is it's being influenced by a magnet. And they would lock onto the master oscillator, but at a different uh, harmonic, so to speak, a different uh, octave, an octave or two away. And as far as I can see, this capacitor here is the secret to the triggering and synchronizing. It's odd. The A stable circuit is quite hard to follow because it's, although it's one of the most popular circuits, that's an LED flasher circuit in its normal use, it's quite hard to follow because there's quite a lot happening at once. As one transistor turns on, it affects the base of the other transistor and it's toggling. It's the fact it's unstable means it's really hard to follow through the circuit because in your mind, it's hard to keep track of the fact that it would continually be swapping. The capacitor value, you get the 47 microfarad, that determines the sort of standby speed, I'd guess, and the re cycling speed, uh, it will probably tune to a rough intermediate frequency of a typical pendulum, a sort of swinging backwards and forwards, that sort of tempo. Then there's this little, it's an electrolytic, but it's 0 0.47, which is 470 nanofarad capacitors, which is coupling directly from the coil, um, probably an induced pulse, because when this, technically speaking, when this coil fires, it's putting a negative. So if this is a positive here and this coil is suddenly turned on by this transistor then this would actually go higher voltage here because this would be referenced to 1.5 plus 1.5 volts but then it would be driven like a little transformer that is complex it's basically an a-stable with feedback and it's quite hard to get your head around it's very very interesting but the idea is that uh, with the magnet swing backwards and forwards it is doing that but it's triggering it's actually locking onto the magnet's frequency and sort of charging up in between time and then just dumping as soon as the magnet goes across but the thing is why the two magnets is it triggering oh that that is hard to get your head around the fact it's got those two magnets, so depending on the direction it comes from, it's going to influence one, and then maybe the other one will fire? Maybe the influencing of one triggers the other one to fire, and that's what attracts it, or does it repel it? It's very hard to say. It's a very, very interesting circuit. Hmm. But there we go. That is what is in the pendulum circuit. I, I think I've more or less run out of things to say. Here is the schematic. Here is the my version of it as a printed circuit board which i will will definitely experiment with now it makes me realize that the current consumption is in the region of say in its unstable state without the pendulum to actually trigger it's roughly about one or two milliamps which seems quite high that would go down gradually as the battery sort of ran down but um it strikes me that this would be perfect for solar power and the fact that in its standby state with the magnet stationary, it does trigger and therefore pushes and pulls the magnet and gives it a good kick, it can actually start the, the pendulums quite well itself. I don't know if that's really needed because theoretically you could just swing the pendulum and start it manually. I don't know why they've specifically made it self-starting. Um, but this would be interesting as sort of like solar powered ornament that kicks off. It makes me wonder what length of a pendulum you could have. Certainly, as you saw at the beginning of this video, it was swinging very slowly because, well, basically speaking, it had, uh, where, where have I put it? I've misplaced it. It had a big piece of wire. There it is. It had a piece of uh, UK Romex America, uh, sorry, UK Twin and Earth uh, America Romex. It's the it's, uh, I think it's one millimeter th uh, three core cable, the solid core, and that's what it had hang from it. So it was a rather slow swing of the pendulum. And I'm guessing from the fact that, oh, let me see, would it, would it have pulsed in between times? Would it have triggered itself just on its time base while that pendulum was at one of the extremes and then just got it in the way past again? It's probably. You know, it's, it will have an optimum speed that's just perfect for a pendulum to get the maximum motion. I've not really tried that. The thing with the pendulums is you need to lock them really hard onto this. If there's any looseness at all, it will just tend to wobble like that with the pendulum staying virtually still hang down below. So you'd have to really grip, uh, maybe use hot melt glue or something to fasten a much longer pendulum on to make sure that it just got up to that speed. It's also possible that if you really overdid it with the weight of a pendulum,
uh, you're going to wear this uh, bearing, even though it's just rocking effectively in a point, it's going to have a slight wearing effect on that because it is plastic. Hmm, interesting thing. I have ordered another pendulum module, which has not arrived yet. Once it arrives, I shall take that apart and reverse engineer it too. But in the meantime, enjoy. This is this one. Oh, hold on. Where's the little label that I had on it? This one was called uh, 8828W. Tekken, T-E-K-K-E-N, is the sort of brand and model. So there we go. Interesting thing.